All right, so we're gonna be going over the to do app challenge, uh, full stack app. Well, let's just get right into it. Um, so we got a lot to do here. We got to create a full back end, got to create a full front end, um, add some additional features uh, once we get um, something up and running. So before I even start this, I just want to take some notes and kind of have a good understanding or good mindset of what I need to tackle um, along with these projects. So I'm going to create a notes.md and just take some notes in it. So we have item number one. Uh, which is our backend. What do we need to do here? So I'm thinking we need to, um, so the order, again, the order uh, is, can be relative, but I usually like starting with the models. So I'm gonna list that first. Then we'll go into serializers. Then I'm thinking views, and then I'm thinking URLs. So let's kind of make sure we remember what these items do. So our models, um, store, and represents our internal application data. Models also um, are responsible for keeping keep the database in sync. All right, so those are our models. Uh, serializers uh, basically convert internal data to external transmittable uh, data formats, in this case, JSON is our good friend. Uh, we don't have a lot of typos today, so deal with it. Um, it also does you know, the same um, in reverse. It takes, also converts um, incoming data to internal representation. So that's JSON to Python model records. Okay, so that, that's what serializers do. Um, views are kind of our central processing uh, unit. They um, handle requests and send out responses. Uh, they work with serializers. Okay, and then we have URLs, probably the easiest to implement, um, simply, um, handle the routing of requests. All right, so I'm gonna start with models and work my way down uh, for the back end. But let's think about the front, uh, front end also briefly. So what all do we need to do for our front end? Um, usually uh, we want to have a router, so an internal uh, client routing mechanism. So let's say our router we'll be using. So this is handle our internal uh, routing within our app. Uh, what else do we have? We'll usually create uh, pages. So just a general, general content um, destinations. I'm not sure what I'm writing here. Um, along with pages, we will create a bunch of components. So this is also about content presenting content usually reflecting bread operations. All right, so again, it is subjective on when you need to create smaller components and when you can just kind of do logic in your pages, but um, kind of want to make sure all of our components are small and concise. Uh, what was I writing here? Usually reflecting. Um, all right. Components, what else do we do on the front end? Uh, we'll need to make API calls. So that's important for getting data. So um, handle getting and passing data uh, to our API. All right, so a lot on this list. What else do we have? Um, also very important, but not Super important is styling. That's probably my favorite part of any project. Uh, we'll save that for last in the front end, uh, or when I even get to it. Again, it's low priority, but it is important for your personal projects and in general to have a good presentation to make uh, you know make your awesome functional app also um, be good eye candy for anyone using it. So make our app look amazing. Okay, so that's what I'm thinking our front end is going to encompass. Again, just kind of high level bullet points. Um, we'll maybe break those down further if we need to, but 
uh, five main things here. Start with our router, create pages, components, API calls, and then styling at the very end. Um, after I get all this done, again, this is my process. You guys might have a different process, um, but I like kind of saving authentication um, after I got kind of like my main features implemented. Some people like doing authentication first. Um, this is a combination of authentication and authorization, I guess. Um, so yeah, again, this is something that some people like to do first. I like to do it last because it's usually not too complicated to shoehorn it in later. So for our authentication, we'll need to um, add <coughs> user to our models. Our serializer would need add a user serializer. You know, it's getting kind of beefy here. Views, um, filter data by user. Um, Hitler, filter. Uh, login, logout functionality. And then our URLs need to um, add support for new. All right. So these are three basic pillars we'll have. Hopefully, each one of them will take you know roughly an hour. Some might be uh, longer. We'll see. But that's my great game plan. Any questions on any of these kind of high level bullet points that we're going to tackle with our project? Okay. So let's get into it. Um, I'm going to create all this in one project. So the first thing I'm going to do is create a folder and call it simply backend. Keep it generic. Um, so I can call that the backend folder. In here, I'm going to go ahead and start downloading all my Django items. So I'm going to go into the backend. And then I'm going to make my virtual environment. So we are all familiar with this by this point, I assume. All right, so VE and V. That will be created here. All right, I want to source that. So dot env bin activate. All right, so I'm in my virtual environment now. That's great. Um, I want to install a bunch of stuff. So I'm going to install Django for sure. I'm thinking psycho PG because I like using Postgres. And I'm also going to use Django REST framework today to kind of expedite our API development. So those are the three items I'm going to install right now. We might install um, something else later, but for now I'm going to go with that. All right, so that was Django, Psycho PG2, and Django REST framework, all one word at the very end there. So this should take maybe another 10 seconds, but definitely not as long as it takes for uh, create React app to run. All right, so that's finished. That's great. Um, always a good time to do a couple extra steps here. Um, so I usually forget a lot of these later on. So I'm going to do a pip freeze into requirements.txt. Um, again, this is going to kind of list all of our libraries that we're using for this project so that, you know, if a year from now I come back to this, I know exactly what library versions I use and I can easily install those rather than having to figure those out. Um, all right, cool. So we got requirements.txt. Let's take a peek. Um, we got Django version 4.04. Um, PsychoPG 2.93 and Django REST Framework 3.131. All right, cool. Um, another thing I like to do is make my git ignore file because I will usually forget that also. So git ignore, ignore. Again, must be named dot ignore. This is just something that your git project will look for. We want to name the, or exclude our virtual environment. So my virtual environment is dot venv. So I exclude that by name. Right there, uh, we could add a few more things. I think PyCache, usually they don't, they don't get too big, but since I'm at it, I'll ignore PyCache. Uh, there's probably some other files I can ignore, but I'll settle for that right now. All right, so that's all the administrative stuff for our Django project. Let's get into actually creating our project. So I want to do Django admin. <clears throat> Let's call this to do, oh, we need to start projects. To do. Raj, and I don't like nested folders, so I'm going to have that space period to avoid nested folders here. All right, I'm going to give that a run. Um, and it goes without saying, if at any point you have a question about anything, please stop me, because it's meant to be a full review, and I want to make sure it's beneficial for everyone. All right, so I'm going to do python manage.py and start my app. So we have Django projects and Django apps. I'm going to call this to do app. That is my naming convention. So I'm going to hit enter there. 
the third thing I want to do is create a database I'm going to use. So let's go with create db to do underscore db. Hopefully, I don't have that created. Cool. All right. So we started our project, started our app, created our database that should take care of all of our main terminal commands. Uh, next up, we need to go to our project settings and fill in a few required uh, items. So installed apps, we actually have two apps we need to um, list here. One is our own personal app, which we've named to do app. Net, the other one is REST framework. This is how we tell Django that we have some extra tools in our toolkit. Um, REST framework, this is a mandatory name, so must be named. Um, this obviously is our own name, so this is our app name. All right, so we update our installed apps. The second thing, uh, since we're using a Postgres database, we need to update our database engine to be PostgreSQL. And our database name was to do underscore db. All right, so that should take care of our product settings for now. Um, again, we might need to add on to our settings a little bit later, but that should be enough to get us going. Um, at this point, we could just do a Python manage.py migrate. Okay, those were the default Django migrations. Again, we have not tackled our models, so our models were not covered there. We could do Python manage.py run server. And if all has gone well, I should see a rocket ship. Uh, I guess I don't even have my browser up, so we'll not see that rocket ship until I bring my browser up. Drag that over here. All right, so we go to localhost 8000, which is default Django port, fingers crossed. Yep, there we go. So rocket ship means we are ready to lift off and I've lost my VS code in the process. Uh, there you go, all right. So, all right, so we got our rocket ship going, our project or server is running. Let's get into the actual items we have to take care of. So the first thing I'm gonna tackle are our models. Um, for this challenge, I don't think our models can get that complicated, but again, always good to kind of make sure you go through um, and think about your models before you kind of just start creating them. Um, one thing, um, this is not expected, but one thing I'm noticing here, I'm getting these yellow squiggles. I know some students have dealt with this. Um, to fix this, basically VS Code is having trouble finding your virtual environment. Um, this will not impact your development as in you can proceed and everything will work but VS Code will not pick up the proper um, module and module names, and that's gonna be kind of annoying for me. So the way to fix it is you wanna go down to your blue bar for VS Code, click on the Python version. So right here, I see 3.9.7. I'm gonna click on that, and then I'm gonna look for an option to enter the enter per path. So I do not wanna use the one on my, um, on my machine. I wanna use the one in my virtual environment. So again, this one's kind of finicky, but I think, if I type it in, it should work. So I'm gonna do current directory slash backend. And the reason this happens, I think, is if you, have, if you have a nested virtual environment, VS Code just for some reason has trouble finding it. That's been my experience. So that's because I have a nested virtual environment inside of another folder. So I'm gonna to navigate to slash backend slash um, dot V-E-N-V slash bin. I think that's how far I need to go. I know I was working with a student yesterday and we had trouble fixing this, but I think you just need to go to the bin folder, hit enter, and there we go. So yellow squiggles are gone. VS Code knows exactly which virtual environment to run. So if I click on this again, notice it's using my .venv and not the one on my machine. And this is strictly for VS Code's like IntelliSense or whatever it's called to give you good recommendations. This is not required, it'll still work if you have those yellow, yellow squigglies, just won't work well as a developer. All right, with that out of the way, let's go and tackle our models. Um, again, as mentioned, our models are not gonna be that exciting. So let's just get them out of the way. So for our to-do site, we want a concept of task lists. So this is gonna be various task lists that we have to uh, complete. They're gonna be comprised of individual tasks that we need to uh, tackle. So models, not model, we need to inherit from that. And just a review, this class has a, all the functionality we need for our basic model. We're just adding on top of it, adding our own fields on top of it. But the, the, the bulk of the magic is built into this class that we're inheriting from. 
All right, so we're gonna maybe have a name. So we'll go with name is models.charfield max length. I usually pick 64 for no reason at all. Um, maybe a description. Wanna know what this task list, task list is all about. So we'll go with description. Models, we'll make that char field max length 255. Um, we can leave that blank. If we don't want a description, no need to do it. Um, that should be fine. I guess we can leave off null no equals true. What else? Um, I'm going to say that's it. I don't want to get too complicated here. So I'm just going to go with name and description. And that's going to be enough for me. Uh, if anyone thinks of another field they want to add, let me know. But don't want to get too complicated with it right now. Would you want to add a field for if it's done or not? Uh, good question. So uh, Edgar, I like, I like that suggestion. We will think about that in a second. And I, I was going to discuss that. So you kind of read my mind there. All right, so I'm just going to implement a dunder string method just to have some good display. Um, this is going to be self dot uh, name should be enough. Uh, it is raining here now. Hopefully, it does not affect my power. But okay, so that's our task list model again. Pretty simple, um, but we get the idea of creating models. We've done that plenty times before. But our next model is going to be individual tasks that we can create. So this would be models that model. Um, I'm thinking this could have a task name, so I'm going to call that task. Maybe not the best naming. It's my model's name task, but whatever. We'll live with it. Uh, let's see, max length uh, 64 seems good enough. Um, we also want to know what list it belongs to. So, again, this is where we get into our discussion of how do you do these two, how will these two models relate, right? Always good to kind of make sure we understand the relationship up front so we don't have to modify it later. But I'm thinking, asking, um, can one task list have more than one task in it. What do you guys think? Yes. Yes, I would agree with uh, Gun Corn over there. Um, yes, I, I, I think, yeah, a task list definitely can have more than one task in it. So that the answer to that question is yes, that's a many relationship from task list to task. Now the reverse side of the question, can one task be associated with multiple task lists? No. Um, yeah, so uh, Elin, I would agree with you. Again, this could be subjective, right? You might theoretically might, might want a task spread across different task lists, but that seems a little chaotic. Um, but yeah, in this case, I'm going to say no. Um, I agree with Elin. Each task can, have, can only be associated with one task list. So in this case, we have a many relationship from task list to task, but we have a one relationship from task to task list. So this is a one to many relationship. If you guys remember, the way we represent, represent that is a foreign key relationship. Um, it is important to locate the foreign key in the appropriate model. Sometimes it takes a second to kind of figure it out because it is not a reflexive relationship. We can't flip the foreign key because I'll flip the one to many uh, direction that we have here. So the foreign key should go in your many side, meaning in this case, task lists can have many tasks in them. Therefore, the foreign key should go on the task model because that is the many side of this relationship. If there's any questions, please let me know. But I'm going to proceed assuming we're good with that. So foreign key, point to the task list model. Andrew Tran. What's up? I think you're I think you're just about to do it right now, but when you type your on cascade delete, does that mean when the task list is deleted, then it deletes all the tasks related to it? Yes. Yep. Okay. So again, there are different strategies you can use. Uh, I know we always kind of prefer cascade, but there's restrict. There are, I think there's set null. So uh, just going off with uh, Andrew Tran summarized there. Um, yeah. So if we deleted the parent task list, any individual task that is linked with it would get deleted since we put models to cascade. But there are different approaches here. There's like a set null. This would say, hey, if the parent gets deleted, just set the task list value to null. So it won't delete the record in the task table. It'll just set the, the reference to null. Uh, another uh, popular one could be restrict. This is saying prevent the parent from being deleted 
if there's a single task that is referencing that particular record. So restrict will prevent you from deleting the task list if it has any, if it has one or more tasks associated with it. So again, there are different strategies based on your um, application design, but Cascade makes the sense, most sense for me because if I delete a parent task list, those individual tasks don't need to stick around. They're going to be dead to me anyway. All right, so we have our model that we're referencing for the foreign key, the, the strategy you want to use for deletions. The third optional but highly recommended field, I highly recommend it, is to have a related name. And just a reminder, this is how we refer to this relationship from the opposite side. So from the forward side, we just refer to a task inst instance and do dot list, and it gives us the relationship from the forward side. The reverse side is how task list will refer to um, the relationship or the records that it uh, is associated with. So this is a many relationship. So I'm gonna name this tasks, plural. All right, so this is a plural relationship because it's a many. So I'm gonna name this task. So again, I always like putting a, a comment here, just showing the kind of that imaginary field that I have access to now that I've created this foreign key relationship. All right, so we should have ask, access to tasks as a kind of a data field in our task list uh, records, even though this is not stored in our database. So not stored in our database, but accessible in Django. So this is just Django being kind of convenient for us, creating this relationship on the reverse side. Okay, that is a task model. We probably need a due date. I think that was part of our requirements. So we'll sneak that in here. Models that, uh, date field, I think that's what we want. I kind of wish uh, Django had like a day field or a year field, but I think date is the only one to get. And we have is completed, as in we'll check off individual tasks. And this could be a Boolean field. I don't think we need to go too crazy with that right now. Okay, so I'm gonna put a default value here, thinking when we create a task initially, it's most likely gonna be not completed. So I'm just gonna say default, if we omit this value, it's going to default to false. Um, dates, I'm not sure if I could have a default date, so I'll leave that untouched. Um, okay, I think that's all I want for my model there. And then I'm going to have my Dunder method here. Okay, so this is what my models look like. Again, your models might look a little different, but we get the idea of what we're going with here. Um, one thing that we want to discuss here, and again, my memory is terrible, but I forget who brought that up. But the question was, do we want to have a completed models.boolean field field here? Um, again, this is subjective. We are the designer. So if you put one here, great, makes sense. Uh, but I'm going to kind of argue against it. Um, and this comes down to what I think my application is going to represent in its data. Um, based on my idea of tasks, lists, and tasks, I'm going to say a task list is going to be completed when each individual task has been completed. So if I want is completed. So given that, I could have a completed data record here, but that's going to be essentially redundant data. The goal of your model should be to minimize data and kind of centralize um, logic in one exact place here. So since I already have task models that are going to have a yes or no for the is completed, I'm thinking that this is going to be redundant. And this is actually slightly dangerous because what if we had all of our tasks marked as completed, but we forgot to flip this completed to true or vice versa? What if we had our completed Boolean on our task list to be true, but we did not actually complete all of our tasks in our list? So that could get our data kind of out of sync. And again, that's my design decision. I want that to be uh, a truth in my application that a task list can be uh, completed if and only if every individual task has been completed. Now you might think like, maybe you can you know, complete a task list without completing every task. That's totally fine, but I'm not gonna go with that approach if you guys are cool with that. So given that, I do not wanna add a new field because that can be redundant um, information. That's something I could derive from my record. So I'm gonna actually create a method here called is completed. And this is going to be an instance method and it's gonna be doing exactly what I said. 
in that it's going to investigate all of the tasks associated with this task list, check is completed, and only if every single task has been completed will I kind of denote that this task list is completed via this method. Any questions about that discussion? Again, this was a design decision, so I don't want to discourage you guys from going through alternative routes. All right, so we need to return. We're gonna get a little Pythonic here, so it's gonna be really condensed. There's a method called all, which is going to check for everything having a true value. Um, this is gonna be a list comprehension. Um, I'm gonna do task that is completed. For task in self dot tasks dot all. All right, so this is a heavily um, Pythonic line. Hopefully, you guys can parse this. Again, it's combining a lot of stuff we learned earlier. So we have a list comprehension right here. Um, so let's break that down first. What this is doing is going through our tasks. Again, that's that imaginary field that we have access to now. We're going through all of our tasks. We're going to grab each one individually in this for loop. And then this list comprehension basically is processed kind of right to left. So this is the last part of the list comprehension. We're gonna get individual tasks and basically grab the is completed value. So it's gonna be a true or false value. So essentially this list right here is going to be a list that's gonna have true and false values in it and that's it. It's gonna be um, kind of like a map. We effectively did a map of tasks. So if you remember, you know, your JavaScript map method, map array method. That's exactly what we did here. We created a new array that just has true or false values based on is completed for each task. And this all method is going to check this array and make sure that every value in there evaluates for true. If it finds a single false, that means we failed the all check. So this is accomplishing exactly what I want. We want every single task to be completed in order for this function to return true. You guys good with that? Andrew Tran. Um, I'm just a little confused. It's not recursive, right? Because it's like calling the function within the function, sort of. Uh, so this all is a query set all. This all is a array method or a list method all. If, if, if you're talking about this all right here. Oh, I mean like the task is completed. Oh yeah, yeah. So this is referring to this field right here. Oh, I, I see it now. Yeah, maybe I Thank can you. rename this. Yeah, so it yeah. gets confusing. Let's say all tasks completed. Maybe it's more descriptive and we, we make it more different. So yeah, so this is a method calling properties on the task. But yeah, I guess naming could be for these things out here. All right, so that's my method. We'll, see, we'll use that method in a second, but these are my models. So I'm happy with my models. Hopefully you guys are happy with them also. Uh, Courtney? If you wanted to show a list of all of the ones that are completed, but like whether or not they're all completed or not, um, how would you do that? So, sorry, was a request that we want to see, uh, we want a list of tasks that have yet to be completed? The ones that have been completed um, or either or, I guess is fine. Yeah, so we could add a method here that says, you know, get all, tasks completed. Again, this comes down to what we need to represent in our, in our um, application or what we need to investigate. So if we did have a need for this, we could probably create, create this. So in this case, um, what's the best way to do this? I know there's a filter method, filter. Um, I might need to look this up, but in this case, we want to pass it. Let's do Google. So we'll do Python filter list method. Filter geeks for geeks. I think it's going to ask me to log in. Hopefully, uh, all right. So filter takes in a function and the sequence. So this will be our list, and the function will be how we extract values out of it. So that's that's going to return true or false based on if we want to keep it or remove it. So if we did filter, we would do a function here. Uh, we'll get more tricky here. So if you guys remember, in Python, anonymous functions are called lambda functions, and they have a, a slightly odd syntax. So um, We'll get practice with lambdas here. So I'll do task is completed. And second one should be our list. So self.tasks.all. I'm not sure if this will be iterable. It should be, but if not, we might need to convert this to a list. But this is how we 
get a list of items that are, um, how many you put a list around here, that are completed. Um, okay, cool. So again, we got to sneak in a Lambda expression. So again, just to go over this, this is just like a fat arrow function. Um, this is the parameter we're sending in. We can send one or more parameters in there. So if I had another parameter, I just separate it with a comma. Um, so as many parameters as you want, no parentheses needed. Uh, the colon is kind of where we start our function definition. And the limitation for Lambda functions in Python is that you can only have one expression. And that is automatically going to be returned. I do not need a return statement here. In fact, it yells at me if I try to put a return statement here. So again, it's a very condensed single line function that takes in one or more parameters and simply returns a true or false in this case for a filter. Um, this is different than fat arrow functions in JavaScript because fat arrow functions can have one or more um, lines or expressions in their body, but lambda function can only have one in Python. Uh, was there a hand raise? I don't know if I missed anything. Uh, yeah, I was just for my own understanding. Uh, the task dot is completed in both the lambda and the uh, the list comprehension. That's referencing the the task variable, not the actual model called task. That's why it's lowercase, right? Uh, yeah, this is an instance of our task model. So yeah, these are gonna be a bunch of instances created from our task model. Um, okay, cool. So these are our models. I'm pretty happy with it and kind of want to move on from here. So let's get to our next few sets. So since we've made our models, we're pretty happy with them. We do Python manage, we're gonna make migrations, make migrations. And I am in the wrong directory, so that is my bad. CD backend. Now we can make migrations. Okay, so we're creating two models. That is accurately summarized there. And then I'm going to do Python manage .py migrate so that my database now has database tables to store my data. All right, so that checks off step one. Right, we just finished our models here. Next up, serializers. Um, this is where Django REST framework finally comes into play. So our models not impacted by Django REST framework. Serializers, views, and URLs are going to be much, much quicker uh, with the use of Django REST framework. So let's create a new file and call it serializers.py. This is an optional naming. You do not have to name it serializers, but kind of a good name for a file that's going to contain serializers. In here, we want to... Um, what do you want to do? We want to import from REST framework. That is the kind of app that has all the REST framework magic. We want to import model uh, with serializers. We also want to import our models. So from models, import everything. All right, so now we're going to create model serializers. This is just the kind of prepackaged way that's going to do most of the heavy lifting for us. Um, so long as we play by its rules. So I'm going to create a mo model serializer class. First one's going to be task list serializer. Again, we're using Django REST framework. We're going to inherit from serializers.model serializer. So this is very similar to what we did in our models, where we have a model kind of base class that has a lot of the magic built into it. Likewise, model serializer has a lot of the magic that we want baked into it. We're just going to simply tell it what particulars we want for each of our serializers. Uh, but again, we need to follow uh, kind of the expected syntax to work with model serializer. So we need a nested class, and it must be called meta. This is not an optional name, must be named meta. We can name our serializer whatever, you know, whatever we want to, um, but the inner class must be called meta because because uh, Django is going to look for that class and use the data that we pass to it. So inside this class, we need to specify two values. One is what model is this going to reflect? So in this case, I want task list for this uh, serializer. And then what fields should this serializer manage? We don't have to manage every field. We could you know, pick and choose, but in this case, we're going to want most of them. So we had, um, what do we have in our model? We had name, I think. Uh, we also had a description. Um, we had a function called um, all tasks completed. We can name this anything we want, actually. So let's call this 
Um, I'm going to call it all done. Kind of a lame name, but whatever. And then we also have tasks. That's that imaginary field, but we do have access to it. All right, so that's, those are the fields that this serializer are going to um, be involved with. But there is one additional thing we need to add here. This field is not part of the model. This is some extra data we are going to send with the serializer, but it's not in our database, it's not part of our model. So this is where we need to do something a little different. We need to create, so this name needs to match the field right here. And we need to specify how we're gonna get the value for this field, because it does not come from our model. So I'm gonna call serializers.serializer method field and tell it, um, let's see, read only. Read only. All right, so a couple of things going on here. We're going to get this value from a method, also known as a function. So that's why we are using serializers, that serializer method field. Again, this is a Django REST framework um, field type. We're also setting read only to true. Again, this is coming from reading documentation, but this field obviously is read only. We cannot assign a value to all done because it is not a field on our model. It's simply a value we, we compute or calculate or whatever and spit it back out. So it's coming from a function, so we can only read from that function, All right? And then um, we need a method here. So this method has to be called get all done. If you wanna choose a different name, you can specify a different name as a parameter in here. But in this case, I'm gonna follow just the default naming conventions. I have a field that I've named all done. I'm using serializer method field. Therefore, I must have a method called get underscore and the name of my field. Because Django is gonna look for this method to get a value for this field. So this will take in um, self and instance. I want to return instance that that function. So our function was get all task complete. I don't know if I like the name of that, but whatever. Um, and there we go. So we have specified a method that will get us the value for this field. This field is, exists in our serializer, but does not exist in our model. I saw some hands raised, so definitely a good time for some questions. Andrew Tran. So the fact that you have this all done sort of in fields like you can't use like the previous thing you use for like the field names mix in right like the little helper function that you used before um yeah that's something i did before i uh, correct it would get a little trickier to do it with that um that kind of hack that i'd use but this is simple enough um listing out our fields shouldn't be too cumbersome and it also get kind of good to know exactly what my serializer has just seeing it visually um but yeah, so that'll be our serializer here. Uh, were there any other questions about serializers as we are serializing away here? Okay, I'm gonna create another serializer for my task model. So model serializer, again, same thing, must create a, a nested class called meta, specify the model that this is gonna track. So this one will, will track the task model. What fields do we care about here? Well, I'm thinking we probably wanna pass back the ID that is the most important item. So we have the task name. What else do we have? Uh, we have the list it's associated with. Uh, what else? We had due dates and then we had is completed. All right, so those are the fields that we are going to track here. Um, none of these fields are gonna be read only, I don't think. Uh, we can assign a list, assign a task name, due date is completed. Um, yeah, I don't think we need to mess with these fields. They're going to be read and write, so we don't, we don't need to specify read only for any of them. None of them are coming from a method, so I think that's all we need to do. So again, serializers took maybe like five minutes stops, um, thanks to DRF. So we can check off serializers. So where's our notes? Kind of mentally check that off. So this part is done. That's done. Next up, views. But again, DRF makes this super, super quick. So we can go to views.py. Sorry, I go to the wrong page all the time. Views.py. We're going to import a few friends from, or just one friend from uh, Django Rust framework. So Rust framework dot views, uh, view sets, I guess. Uh, one question that you might have, and this is just, again, personal preferences. 
in my serializers, you, you might have noticed that I imported from Rust framework the whole um, the whole serializer module. The reason I did that it was because I knew I was going to use some additional items from the serializer module. So instead of kind of um, listing all those out up here, I just get the entire module and kind of pick off everything I want from that serializer um, module. Versus in views, the only thing I want is model view set. I, I don't think I'm going to use anything else from view sets. So I'm just going to import the one class that I want. I'm going to use it here. I saw a hand raised. Uh, please ask your question. Yeah, back in the serializer, I'm still trying to uh, figure out what you did there with between the uh, the all done on line 10 and line 12. Uh, what what the I see how you or where you got the all done from from line eight, but how did you what what you're doing with what are you doing with the um, function on get all done when why we're doing that again. Sure. Um, so again, a lot of this is going to come from reading documentation. So I might kind of encourage you guys to look that up. But basically, um, we're using something called serializer method field. This is one of many different fields we can specify here. Um, just to give you a clue, there are like serializer dot string field, uh, string related field. This will convert your values to their uh, Dunder string representation. Unfortunately, this is read only. So some of these fields are inherently read only. Um, there's also a uh, primary key related field. This is a default representation for any um, related field. So in this case, I guess in this case, I have lists. This would be a primary key related field kind of deep by default. If I want to change it, I could specify how to extract that data by assigning different serializer fields to it. In this case, I chose serializer method field because this, this means my data value will come from a method, also known as a function. So serializer method field is specifically going to look for some function that it needs to call to get a value back for it. So what, when we're serializing up our data, you know, we can get ID, we can get name, we can get description and tasks really easily because those exist on our model. We're getting those from here, here, ID is kind of baked in and task is that related imaginary field that we get. So we have access to the data for each model um, already for these fields, but the one data that we don't have is all done because that does not exist in our model. So we are basically saying we're adding new data here and we're going to assign that a value from this function that we specified. Now, one thing that I mentioned is that this function must be named get um, whatever, where that whatever matches the name of your field here. So since I call this all done, I need to use all done right here to specify how that field is going to get a value. And then since I'm using serializer method field, I need a function that's going to give me that value. And Django will automatically call this function because I have named it in the way that Django expects it to be named. So it, it needs to be called get all done here because I've named the field all done in my list. This function is going to return some value. I could compute whatever I want in here. Like I could have done all this in that function, but I wanted to have this method on my model because I could see myself using it um, outside of my serializer. So that was a design decision. But again, we can return whatever we want here. This is up to us because we are the ones sending out the data. Okay, makes perfect sense now. Thank you. Oh, no, thank you for your question. Yep. Uh, Andrew Tran? Yeah, so right now the all done field only changes when you run your serializer, right? Uh, it's yeah, it's not even changing. So when we create our serializer instance, basically we're going to populate all these fields and send that out as JSON, right? That's what our serializers do. Takes in Python data and converts it to JSON data. So when you say it's going to change it, um, it's just it's just telling it how we're going to fill in that data when the serializer gets created. Okay. Okay. So like it's really it's not like a field on the model itself because like fields on the model can change in the database, but the get but the all done thing isn't even something in the database. Right. It's yeah, just a this, method connected to it. Yeah, this is like a layer on top of our model um, that we're adding. So it is a field for our serializer, but not in our model. So yes, it does not exist in our database. It's just a, kind of a derived value that we are using uh, for convenience. Uh, was there another hand raised there? Uh, John Price. Uh, yeah, so if you have, um like a class within a class, for instance, like on your Netflix, you have the reviews, um, 
you had another class nested within your reviews that had, uh, I can't remember what it was, and you used the energy choices. Uh -huh. How does that affect your serializer? Because would that be another field? If you want it to be a field, it can be a field. Um, in that case, yeah, from the Netflix project, we had, I think, the value of Netflix like rating, like if it was good, bad, average, whatever. Um, it's up to you. Again, if you want to send that data to your front end, so your front end knows like what data values to use, you can. However, I would encourage, I would recommend that should be sent as a different serializer value because that's like constant value, that is static data. Each record you send should not need to send, you know, that, those constant values um, to the front end. But if you do want your front end to know about it, yeah, you can create another serializer and say, you know, rating types and send that like one time. So your app front end says, give me all the rating types that exist. You'll send it to it. And again, you don't, that, that would kind of avoid you having to send it with each individual uh, review, I guess in that case from Netflix. And um, inside the, the the meta class, when you're referring to the model, would you be able to just call that rating or would you need to like include that it was nested within, within the review class? Um, that's a good question because it's not a model in that case. You might not be able to use model serializer. Uh, I'm not sure if Django Rust framework has like a generic serializer. I bet it does. Like we dig into this. Yep, there's a generic serializer class. I bet we could use that for integer choices. I've not tried it, but I'm willing to bet it's probably uh, simply done. Um, all right, any other questions on serializers? Jesse? Oh, I forgot to put my hand down, sorry. Okay, cool. So going back to our views, um, again, this is gonna be super simple. We'll complete this and then we'll do our URLs because those are gonna be simple too. And then we'll take a much, much needed break. So in our views, we need to import model view set, which has a lot of magic. Django magic, Django Rust framework magic built into it. And we also want to import our serializers because we're going to use them here. So from serializers, let's just import everything. Be lazy about it. All right, so we got to create view sets. View sets handle requests and they handle all the CRUD functionality kind of just behind the scenes. It's, they're amazing. They're probably my favorite thing in Django Rust framework that I've worked with. So we'll create a task list model. Uh, we don't need model in there, view set. Which will inherit from model view set. Again, there are a couple of fields that we need to specify. And if you forget, that's okay. That's what documentation is for. But I know what fields we need. One is the query set, which is going to be how we get our data for the serializer. So task list objects.all. And we also need to tell it how to serialize data. So we need to tell it just the serializer class. We're not going to call this serializer. We're just telling this view set what serializer it can call if it needs to package up data or unpackage data um, uh, that's being sent um, back and forth between our client and server. So those are only two things I need. It's that simple. And then I could copy this and get a task serializer in no time. Let's make sure I update the appropriate items. There we go. That took less than two minutes once we got started. Uh, we have serializers which will handle all of our CRUD functionality for us. So create, read, update, delete. That's baked into model view set. In, in case we forgot, we could dive in to model view set. Notice that we in, actually inherit from six base classes. Um, this is inheritance at play. So we have a create mode, retrieve mode, update mode, destroy mode, list mode. These are the five main actions that we do for CRUDing, right? So that's all those are handled in individual base classes. So it's good organization. Uh, Rob works, question? Yeah, Ankur, I'm still a little fuzzy. What do the two uh, views there do again? What are, can you kind of recap on those again? Are you talking about these? Down Both here? the task list view set and task view set. I still don't quite understand that. Yeah, so absolutely. So view sets are DRF magic. Uh, view sets. Man, I cannot type. Uh, view sets. Um, will handle incoming requests from the client, process them, and send JSON responses. See, they handle lists, creates, detail, updates, partial update, and uh, delete. 
So remember when we did this by hand, we had to create individual views that would list every item we have, like every task list that we have. Create new task list would be another operation we had to support. Get detail for one individual item, update an individual item, and also delete an individual item. All of that is being done by this view set. So again, instead of us writing again, if you remember, we had to write individual handlers like task list list request. I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but just a reminder, we had to go through this and then we had to like investigate, all right, if request was a post, we had to do one thing. Do you guys remember this? Those nightmares coming back. Um, so we had to like investigate the method, determine what we need to do. The task list view set or the view set is doing that already. It's going to know what method we get and based on the methods, you're like, all right, cool. We need to get detail or we need to create something. Like it handles everything that we've done by hand manually. So we understand what's going on because we did it all ourselves one day. Um, but this is, again, does all of it for us because it's pretty basic standard operations. Once we tell it the model and how to package up the data, the view set can do the rest for us. Uh, any other questions on view sets? Again, a lot going on behind the scenes, but hopefully you understand kind of mentally what would be going on if we wrote those code ourselves. Okay, so those are our view sets. Not much more to write. It's literally six lines of code. Um, super simple, but a lot going on behind the scenes. So we'll just accept that work from Chicken Rest Framework. The last thing we're gonna do here is our URLs, and then we'll take our break. So I'm gonna go to our project URLs and gonna do those first. So let's get rid of all this. I'm gonna need this include function. So I'm gonna create a path to get to my app. I'm gonna call this to do underscore API, just to give it a nice base name. And then I'm going to include my app. So my app is to do underscore app. We're gonna create a new file called URLs um, that we're gonna reference for routing. All right, so that's what my project URLs look like. Next, I need to go to my app and create a new file called URLs.py. So this is gonna create a uh, container routing for our um, app here. But this is gonna be a little different than what we did on, a, on the project level. We're gonna use another friend from Django REST framework. So I'm gonna import from REST framework dot routers import default router. The whole purpose of default router is just to create a standard naming scheme for all your routes kind of automatically. So that we don't have to like think about it, we don't accidentally have to you know create a non-standard um, or non uh, what's the word I'm looking for non-consistent uh, path. All of them are going to be kind of in the REST uh, mindset of how we create these paths. So default router, we're going to create an instance of our router. So we do router equals default router. We get an instance from the class. Hopefully we remember OOP terminology there. Um, once we have our instance, we could register our view sets. So that's something I need to import from dot views imports all of our view sets. We need to register those view sets. So again, three parameters go here, very similar to what we do with our paths. The first item is the base name for the, the URLs that we're going to generate. So I'm going to call this task lists. Uh, the second is the view that's going to handle it. So I guess we don't have a good example here, but uh, it's basically just the view set. So in this case, it's going to be task list view set. That's going to handle all of our requests, right? As we talked about. The last item is, I believe, base name. And this is just used internally. We don't really need to worry about it. But this, these are how the views are going to be named. Again, so this is base URL path. Who's going to handle the request? And just some additional naming business that we don't need to worry about. OK, so we have two models and two, uh, two view sets. We need two registers here. So I'm gonna copy and paste to make this a little quick. All right, so we register the task view set and the task view set, sorry, task list view set and the task view set. Um, now that we have registered them, it's super easy to get all of our URLs. So if I do um, path, let's go with no base path, include, router.urls. And this will generate a whole list of URLs for us. I know I tried listing them one time and I failed. Um, 
wonder if I could try it this time. So URL. Hopefully it'll work the second time. Okay, so we have a bunch of URLs generated for us. They will be automatically routed to the appropriate view sets. So we don't have to do anything extra. So let me save that. All right, so going back to our notes, <clears throat> we have accomplished models, which probably took the most time because we did not have Django West framework magic there. And we also had kind of sense a good time thinking about them, but serializers, views, and URLs, these were pretty simple because we were able to leverage the router. <clears throat> call that default router. Um, here we were able to leverage view sets. And then here we were able to uh, leverage model and serializer. So good friends from DRF. All right. Um, all right. So with that in play, I'm just going to launch our server and then we'll take our break. So hopefully everything was done right. But if not, we'll get some good feedback from our terminal here. So I'm going to run server. Or do I have that running already? I do have that running here. Let's relaunch that. Okay, so again, I have failed at listing out the URLs. I'll figure that out one day. But importantly, we are running our server. If we refresh now, all right, this is actually a good thing. This is not a bad error. This is Django telling us, well, hey, I don't know what's at the base route, but I have additional routes you can go to. So we go to slash to do API. And there we go. So we are at the Django Rust framework API view. This is something that Django Rust provides for us so that we could easily navigate through um, our items. Obviously, we don't have any data to view, but we can you know, go to tasks and we can post something. So we do a post request to this URL that's going to create a new item. Um, but right now, I don't want to create a task because I need to have a task list. So let's create a task list. Let's say weekend uh, to do's stuff I need to get done. Okay, so we can use this API view kind of like the admin panel where we could add data. So if I post this, it should work hopefully, fingers crossed. There we go. This was our, this is our new task list model created. Notice I provided two values. Um, tasks, those will be added later. All done is a read only field. So I'm not able to kind of write to it when I create it. But now that I have a task list, I could go back to my tasks and let's add a new task. Uh, one thing I do need to do, unfortunately, is uh, finish doing my taxes, always annoying, always boring. That's going to be my single list that I have here. Due dates. I think the due date for task filing is the 18th. We'll see if I uh, finish it. It is not complete. So I will leave that unchecked. Post here. And there we go. Got our single task here. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with going through creating data. So I'll probably do that over the break. Uh, before we take a break though, Andrew, do you have a question, comment? Yeah, so if you go to your view sets, um, I, I'm looking at the past notes and like, this is where if you wanted to limit like request methods use, just change HTTP method names, right? Yes. And my question after that is when you go to the router and you have your HTTP method names and it only allows maybe like head and get, does the router, does the, the router knows automatically to not make to only make those two paths, right? The paths exist, but the access does not. So I, the routes still exist. You can still okay. go to them. So I'm going to actually try it right now, if you guys don't mind. I'm saying I can only post to uh, the view set uh, view. So if I make this change and I go to API root, uh, servers, all right. If I click this, this is going to be a get request. I have told my view set that get requests are not allowed. So if I do this, I can still navigate to it, but notice I get an error this time. So this is a view set saying, hey, you tried to do a get request. It got to me, but I'm going to tell you, you're not getting any further. So it's just giving me a applicable error message here. But this route can still, you can still send a get request to it. The route still exists, especially because you can still post to it. So that route needs to exist for posting since we can create items. But in this case, I said no gets allowed. Uh, but that's just not what we want to do, but I'll leave that around just for reference in case we need to do it. Um, okay, so that was a lot we covered. Uh, I think we've gone for like an hour strong here, uh, but in that hour, we were able to create our backend. Uh, I would say a fully functioning backend. Again, we might need to add some more things later. 
but we got our core core items down here. So I think that's uh, high fives all around, high five. Um, let's take a break now. So it is 10.02. Uh, we've been going at it for a while. So, um, sorry, Jin, do you have a question? Oh, no, I'm uh, just gonna ask if you can look at the air I have during the break. Sure, all right, so let's take a 13 minute break. Please be back at 10.15 and we will continue on with the front end. Can you show us the URLs, Delphine?